these diseases at the molecular level, we can beat them. If we don't beat them that way, we probably will have the enormous expenses of essentially uh, uh, compassionate care that doesn't, doesn't save lives. If you had to fast forward um, 10 years or maybe 15 years, do you see the, the, uh, the health landscape changing dramatically because of this? It should. i will be disappointed if it doesn't because the fact is every, there's much complaint saying this stuff is fiendishly expensive. It is at the front end, just like building the first Intel microprocessor can cost you a billion dollars, but now we put it in children's toys, okay? The, these are know-how industries, they're information industries, the upfront costs are very high, but the costs of replicating this stuff once you, you got it are, are very low. We're doing work now that is going to be affecting healthcare for generations to come. Yes, it looks very expensive now, it will end up very cheap, and it is way cheaper than sticking people in hospitals with nurses and doctors and other very well-meaning people who are doing everything they can, but in fact they can't do anything. They, you can't reverse Alzheimer's once it's there. You know, these, these diseases at the molecular level, we can beat them. If we don't beat them that way, we probably will have the enormous expenses of essentially uh, uh, compassionate care that doesn't doesn't save lives. And what's the biggest hurdle uh, in terms of um, this medical revolution you're, you speak well, of in your book? As I say, the first challenge is just getting the biology right. It's not designing the drugs to control it. We, we are really good. We have about three close to magical tools on this. One is called structure-based design, the other is monoclonal antibodies, and now in the last few years, literally, they have the technologies for reaching down into stem cells and immune system cells and reprogramming. This looks exactly like reprogramming computer. They go in there, they snip out bits of code, they put new ones in, and they're having some astonishing results What's in the, cancer you know, trials. Some of these, I mean, these technologies sound amazing and, and whatnot. What's the biggest, maybe, um, social hurdle or, or political hurdle or, it's, or it's legal the, hurdle? It's the, it's the FDA, without doubt. Uh, not, none of this, none of this gets into your body or mind or anybody else's without FDA permission. Not even these diagnostic tools. You know, the FDA has been clamping down on 23andMe, uh, not because they're gathering bad data, but, but because the FDA says we don't fully trust your interpretations of this data. I don't think they can even constitutionally do that, but they've slowed things down by several years there. Getting the drugs through the FDA means pushing them through clinical trials. The conventional clinical trials use zero molecular data. They gather, they have a clinical definition of the disease, they say let's throw the drug at it, you know, and have a vote. I mean, some people get the drug, some will get a placebo, and then we'll have a vote, see if the drug passes or fails. It's not how drugs are designed this day, today, it's not how they should be prescribed. You don't take people indiscriminately. You understand their, their deep down molecular profiles of their cancer in their body uh, and the variations from body to body. And, and if you don't run clinical trials that take this into account, you're going to reject a lot of drugs that we do need, okay? It's as simple as, as, simple as that.